Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth is a well-known Jewish idiom that basically means, think of the English phrase from top to bottom. It's kind of like that. It basically means everything. In the beginning, God created everything. Plain and simple. And then if you skip down to the end of the chapter, after six days of God hard at work, we read this, chapter 1, verse 31. God saw all that he had made. How much of what he had made? All of what he had made. And it was very good. The word good is tov in Hebrew. Can you say that? Well done, tov. And it has to do with the human senses, taste, touch, sight, smell, and sound. In the scriptures, tov is used of bread, wine, honey, lotion, perfume, fruit, a feast, a home, and the shade under a tree on a hot Middle Eastern day. It can be translated lovely or beautiful, the taste of fresh, well-made food from a food cart on the east side is tov. Are you with me? The smell of crisp alpine air when you're out on a hike at Mount Rainier or whatever is tov. The sight of a work of art is tov. And sex is tov. We read that God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So everything in the created order, at least in the beginning, food and drink, the beach at Oswald West, all the way up to the snow on Mount Hood for all of you Instagrammers who live in between, all of that, the sound of music from Phil and company tonight, all of that, everything that God created in the beginning he called good, and that includes everything that we call sex. Beauty, attraction, chemistry, the desire of a man for a woman, or vice versa. Touch, kissing, foreplay, intercourse, the orgasm. Can I say that word in front of thousands of people? All of that. It's all tov. It's all good. In fact, we read it's very good. Now, this says a lot about sex, but it says even more about God, right? You know, a lot of people think of God as an old, crotchety, grumpy man up in the sky who's mad at the world and doesn't want anybody to have any fun. That's fun. Let's call it sin. Stop it. I remember in high school, I was like, why is everything that sounds fun wrong? Come on. Come on, right? That's how a lot of people think about God. But nothing could be further from the truth. God is the creator of what? Everything. At least everything that is very good. God is a God of enjoyment. He was in the beginning, and over the millennia, I would argue, nothing has changed. I love that line in Paul's letter to Timothy, if you know the New Testament at all. He writes this, God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I love that word, enjoyment. We need a theology of enjoyment not just when we talk about sex, but when we talk about food and drink and the beach and nature and creation, when we talk about all of life, we need a Genesis-shaped worldview that basically says this world was created by God in the beginning. He called it very good. He enjoys it, and so should we. He thinks it's very good, and so should we. And we need to enjoy at least all the very good stuff in creation as an act of worship, of hedonism, that is turned into worship to the true and living God. Food and drink and nature and beauty and, I would go on to say, sex. My wife, who's coming up a little bit later this evening, and myself, um, we married really young, and uh, by the generous, generosity of God, we were both virgins when we married. Now, don't write me off. I know I just lost about a 1,000 of you. Um, don't write me off, and we'll get to more of my heart behind that lately, later. But our honeymoon, in all honesty, was a little bit clumsy and awkward, but it was so much fun. We were in London, England, and I, I will never forget lying in bed one night on my honeymoon thinking, realizing that what I was enjoying was all God's idea. Like he was the one who thought it up, not a really clever marketing guru in Hollywood, not Tom Hanks at Meg Ryan, right? Not Beyonce, shocker, but... He 
He was the one who thought it all up. Everything that I was enjoying was from his mind's eye, from his imagination. It was all his creative genius. That's what Tove does, at least for those with eyes to see. It makes you take a step back and breathe it all in after a good meal or when you make love to your wife on your honeymoon or after you watch the sunrise. It makes you step back and breathe it all in and well up with gratitude to the creator God who is just that good. Rewind a paragraph or two to chapter one, verse 27, and we read this, and it's really intriguing to me. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then we read this. God blessed them and said to them, first words out of God's mouth to human in all of the scriptures, quote, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Did you know that the very first commandment in all of the Bible is be fruitful and increase in number? You know, a lot of people harp and and gripe about how the Bible is full of rules. Sure, there's truth in that. And the first one is have sex with your spouse, a lot. They're not all bad rules. (laughs) Some of them, I know I'm a married man, but some of them are fantastic, right? Like, you have me from page one. God, I'm in. (laughs) The story's fantastic. Yes, fantastic. And, uh, you know, this language of be fruitful and increase in number, it's strange to you. I mean, we don't talk about sex that way anymore because in the modern world with the advent of birth control and contraceptives, we've disconnected, for better or for worse, we've disconnected sex from procreation. So we would say make love or sleep together or have sex, but it's the exact same idea. And that is, listen to me carefully, that is the first commandment in all of the story of God, first thing out of God's mouth. For too long, however, sadly, the church's message on sex has essentially been shrunk down to don't. Stop it. It's basically the summation of what I grew up hearing. Stop it, don't. Don't view porn. Don't masturbate. Don't make out, at least not too much. Don't, (laughs) a little bit's okay. We all call it good, but (laughs) not too much. Don't sleep together before you get married. Don't move in. Don't cohabitate. Or Nobody calls it cohabit. Don't move in together. It's cheaper rent. Come on, give me a break. Don't do that. Stop it. It's fun. No, don't. And all of that, in my opinion, which is right, (laughs) all of that is true. But the problem is that the scriptures don't start with a negative command about sex. Don't. They start with a positive command. Be fruitful and increase in number. One of the first things that we read about Adam and Eve in just a chapter or two is that they were both naked and they felt no shame, end quote. Can you imagine sex with no guilt and no shame, nothing to hide at all? Just pure, innocent pleasure with another human being in a covenant relationship until death do us part. That, my friends, is Tov. In fact, that is very Tov. And that is what God created in the beginning. And notice that all of this is before the fall. If you know the story of God, Genesis 3 is where it gets really lousy, all right? Genesis 1, 2, your loving life. Genesis 3, dang it. All of this is before Genesis 3. My buddy Mike Erie, who's not able to make it tonight, um, he puts it this way, and I love the language. We were sexual before we were sinful. You need to get that. We were sexual before we were sinful. Sex is not an evil curse that we have to curb and deny. It's a good gift that we need to enjoy as long as it's in the right context. Marriage, more on that in a little while. Sadly, or obviously, we don't live in the garden anymore, right? We live post, dang it. (laughs) And we are sinful now, right? Maybe sex isn't, but... But we are sexual and we are sinful now. But still, turn over to the Song of Songs. Um, In the middle, turn over, and yes, you heard me right. We're going there, right? This is Liveology. A couple thousand single people, why not? Let's do it. Um, If you're new to the scriptures, the Song of Songs, which is also known as the Song of Solomon, depending on what version of the Bible that you read, is at the tail end of the Hebrew wisdom literature. So it's right after Proverbs. If you get to the prophet Isaiah, turn around. And actually, it's not a book per se, as much as it's an ancient collection of erotic Jewish love poetry, and it's in the Bible. Come on. 
or not. Um, Orthodox Jewish males aren't actually allowed to read the song until the age of 30. So if you're an Orthodox Jewish guy and you're 25, I just apologize in advance. Um, For a long time in the church, people have been trying to turn the song into, basically into an allegory. The idea of a racy love poem in the Bible makes a lot of people, in particular, a lot of conservative people cringe because it sounds more like Beyonce and Jay-Z at the Grammys than it does like something you would hear in a sermon. (laughs) And that makes a ton of people really, really uncomfortable. And so over the years, people have been trying to make the song into something else, something less explicit, something maybe a little bit more spiritual sounding. And as a result, lots of smart, intelligent people read it as a picture, basically as an allegory, but as a picture of Jesus and the church. So lips don't really mean lips, and kissing doesn't really mean kissing. I mean, we don't do that in church. And obviously breasts don't really mean breasts. It's not about intimacy between a man and a woman. It's about intimacy between, you know, people and Jesus. I will never forget years ago, a true story. I was at church. It's a great guy up teaching, and he was teaching from the Song of Songs as an allegory. And at one point, he read that line in chapter one where it talks about how the king is lying between his lover's breasts all night long. Don't, I'm not going to exegete that for you. You figure it out. And, I mean, don't figure it out, but you know what I'm saying. Anyway, he gets to that spot and he goes, true story, the left breast symbolizes the Old Testament. The right breast symbolizes the New Testament and in between is the cross. I'm just, (laughs) ah, I think I was 19 at the time. Just stop it. No, stop it, stop it. I haven't gone to seminary yet, but that's just weird, no. It's just weird, it's just gross. Um, I think that The poet just means their stuff at night with her breasts. Let's call it good. So with all due respect, I don't think the song is an allegory. If you're here and you do, that's fine. Just put up with me and my sarcasm for the next 10 minutes. But on a serious note, I read it as a celebration, um, not only by the author, whoever he or she is, but also by God himself of love and marriage and sex between two people in relationship for life. And however you interpret it, it's highly sexual. So chapter four, if you're there, turn to chapter four, is actually a sex scene. We read about a man and a woman on the wedding night. The wedding is at the end, right before. She's undressing, and the man is writing about her body from the top down. You ready for this? Chapter four, verse one. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful, right? His mouth is, is filled with praise for his new bride. And he starts from her face and works down. Your hair is like a flock of goats. I would not encourage you to lead with that, guys. It's, <laughs> this is really, really ancient poem. Descending from the hills of Gilead, your teeth, this is actually my favorite part, are like a flock of sheep, just shorn, wait for it, coming up from the watching. Each has its twin, not one of them is alone. She's not missing any teeth. This is, a, this is the ancient Near East. This is fantastic. Right? You set the bar low. You have all your teeth. We are in for life. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your fail are like the halves of a pomegranate. So now he moves to her neck and her breast. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. This next part is a bit ambiguous, but you get the idea. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no flaw in you. Now, it's easy to read this and laugh because, you know, we don't live in an agrarian society and the ancient, earthy, organic language is lost on us, but it's actually genius because the poet is able to invoke highly sexual imagery without ever sounding crass. And if you skip down a stanza or two to verse 12, we read this. You, this is the husband speaking to the wife, are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Um, Now that's a way of saying she was a virgin. A fountain was a ancient euphemism for a woman's sexuality. So she is a sealed fountain meaning she's not easy to get into. She's a virgin on her wedding night, 
And, but she's anything but a prude. She is an eager participant in this evocative scene, saying to her lover, if you skip down to 16, this is the woman now speaking, awake north wind and come south wind, blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. She's inviting her husband in after a time of foreplay. And then we read this. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh and my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. So this is erotic and explicit, but it's not crass at all. It's poetic and it's beautiful. This is a husband and a wife on the wedding night, lying in bed after it's over, reveling in the moment. But the story isn't quite over. It ends with a fascinating interpolation from above. And this is my point for tonight. Listen to this next line. Eat, friends, and drink. Drink your fill of love. Now, I'm not sure about you, but in my Bible, the NIV, there's a heading that's not actually in the original language, but is in the English, where at the top of that, it says friends, as if the friends are saying that. Um, But that's not in the original language, and quite a few people think that's not right. The question is, who's the voice? Who's saying that? Eat, friends, and drink, drink. Who's saying that? The friends aren't in the room, at least I hope not. I know it was a long time ago, but not that long ago. Um, who, who's saying that? Well, honestly, we think that it's God. God is saying that. God is saying, eat friends and drink. Drink your fill of love. How crazy is that? The maker of the sun and the moon, the maker of the human body, is singing over two lovers on their wedding night. That's what God is like. His view of sex, I'm not sure what your view of sex is, but his view of sex is incredible. Even in a post-Genesis 3, outside of the Garden of Eden world, where now we are sexual and we are sinful, even in a world with so much pain and regret and baggage and damage from sexuality gone awry, even after all that, God is still singing over the gift that he created. Through the fall, to the screwed up world that we now call home, and over all the noise, God is still singing, it's very good, drink your fill of love. That, my friends, wherever you are at tonight, that's powerful. But, sadly, like everything tove in God's universe, sex can be warped and turned into something ugly. Turn over to Romans, um, to the New Testament, to the writings of the New Testament. If you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then Acts. Then there's an epistle, which is a stuck-up way of saying a letter um, (laughs) to the church in the city of Rome, hence the name Romans. It's written by this guy named Paul hundreds and hundreds of years after the Song of Songs. It's really interesting what he starts off by saying. You there, Romans 1? You guys doing all right? You you good? One of you out of 2,800 people. It's fan-freaking-tastic. Moving on. Romans 1. I am really happy. Whoever you are, I'm just really happy about you this evening, all right? So, Romans chapter 1, let's start off, uh, skip down to 18. This is Paul, and he's just warming up, and he writes this. The wrath of God is being revealed right now as we speak, from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, stay with me. Although they claimed to be wise, smart, letters after the name, whatever, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore... God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading or the dehumanizing of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie 
and worshiped, this line is stunning, worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Ever since the garden, we've been mistaking the good creation for the even better creator. Eve had a choice to make between the fruit and God, between the creation and the creator, and she chose to take a bite. And now as a result, all of her children, all of her sons and daughters, i.e. all of us, are born with the exact same slant. So Romans was written obviously a long time ago, but if you know anything about Paul's letter to the church in Rome, it was written over against the backdrop of a story you may or may not know about Israel and the exodus out of Egypt into the land of God. And if you know that story, there's a really interesting part, at least I think it's really interesting, where the Israelites, in context, are slaves. They have nothing, but right before they walk out of Egypt, they ask the Egyptians for gold. And we read this line, God made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people And they gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians. So in this story, dirt poor, working class slaves, victim after victim of oppression and injustice, overnight become wealthy, become kings and queens, so to speak. And it's all because of God's generosity. But just a few months later, you skip forward a chapter or two, and they are out in the desert. Moses is up on Mount Sinai with Charleston Heston or whoever, and the people get antsy, and so they ask Moses' brother, Aaron, to make them a god to worship. They're tired of waiting for the god in thunder and fire and cloud. He's scary and far. They want a god to worship. And then Aaron says this, quote, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. He took what they had handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioned it with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Question, where did they get the gold? I mean, days before, weeks before, they were slaves with nothing. Where did they get the gold? Anybody? Yeah, from God. Because of God's generosity, they, quote, plundered the Egyptians, meaning they made an idol out of the very thing that was a gift from God. Are we any different? Good thing we have evolved over the millennia, right? We have this, this, this slant, this bent, this propensity, and this proclivity to turn gifts into God's to turn the creation into a de facto creator. I mean, after all, we're hardwired for worship, right? Next slide, Um, the novelist David Foster Wallace, who's just a genius, not a follower of Jesus, and right before his suicide, he said this, quote, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship, and an understanding reasons for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing, be it Yahweh or the Wiccan mother goddess or the four noble truths or some infrangible set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Worship your own body and beauty. (laughs) Spelled wrong. That's all this guy and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly, and when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's that they are unconscious. They are default settings. That's genius. We were made to worship God, but because of sin, now we have default settings to the language that's used by both Wallace and by Paul to idolatry. We have this tendency to take God's gifts and turn them into wannabe gods, and sex is no exception, right? Paul writes, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Paul's first example of idolatry is not money, but it's sex. That's telling. 
Now, in Paul's day, the goddess of sexuality was called Aphrodite. She had a few other names, but that was by far the most popular one. Paul spent a few days in her hometown, Ephesus, getting a church up and running right under her nose. We have writings from the ancient Greeks um, about how people would come from all over Ephesus because it was stacked, the temple was stacked with 1,000 temple prostitutes. We read that at least, 1,000. So people would come from all over the Mediterranean to worship with one of the prostitutes, i.e. have sex with somebody they barely know. So that sounded all familiar. Aphrodite is alive and well. Today, she is the CEO of a multi-billion dollar global industry. Entertainment, television, marketing, porn, strip clubs, fashion, cosmetics, health, fitness, plastic surgery, Botox, Viagra, her temple is ubiquitous. And she is not easy to please. She demands we make sacrifices. We have to give up our innocence, our holiness, often our body's well-being or relationship's well-being, and of course, our freedom. Of course, our freedom. Because if and when we turn sex or anything else into a god, it becomes a cruel tyrant. What was supposed to function as a good gift for you to enjoy as an act of worship to God in the context of marriage instead becomes an addiction with a strange, otherworldly power over you. It's one of the crazy things about our generation. I mean, more, our parents' generation started the sexual revolution. Thanks, mom and dad. Um, They were rolling around naked at Woodstock or whatever. Hopefully not my parents. Dad, you're here. I don't want to know if that's true. Um, But now a few decades later, half a century later, we value sexual freedom and self-expression more than any other generation in human history. In fact, we think of it as a right. I have the right to have sex with whoever I want, whenever I want. And anything that curbs our sexual freedom or self-expression is seen as repressive, as bigotry, as hateful. And it's seen as a denial of our identity of who we are. But we're just now starting to learn that what looks like freedom is actually slavery. That what looks like self-expression is actually nothing more than dysfunction because when sex is your God, you have to download porn. You have to jack off. You have to sleep with your boyfriend. You have to let him or her touch you. You have to give in to your body's cravings. Even if you know it's going to steal from your future, there's no choice because you're a slave. You could put it this way. We think of freedom as the ability to do whatever we want, whenever we want, with whoever we want. But to Jesus, that's not freedom, that's slavery. Freedom, at least in Jesus' mind, is the ability to do what God made you to do, to enjoy all the tove in the world as God intended. That's why the message about Jesus is good news, it's gospel, because Jesus is Lord of the universe, not Aphrodite, brothers and sisters. And he has the power to sweep the legs out of every single pharaoh and oppressor and injustice on earth. In Jesus and in Jesus alone, we can and will and do live free. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe you're under the power not of Jesus the Lord, but of Aphrodite or of money or of power or of fame or of beauty or of edu- whatever it is for you, you're under the power of something else that does not go by the name of Jesus and it is a cruel tyrant. Maybe it is a personal being, maybe it is an impersonal being. But I want you to know a few things. One, there is a creator, God, and he made you and he made the world that you call home and everything very good all around you has his fingerprints all over it. Two, this world is not as it should be. You are not as it should be. Something went wrong in the story, not only of God, but of human history. But God's love for you through all of that, the love of the creator for the creation, of the father for the son, is unbending. Last night, my five-year-old asked me, Daddy, would you still love me if I didn't love Jesus? And I said, absolutely. I would be sad. I would be devastated, but I would still love you. And then he ran off and started laughing. (laughs) But God's love for you 
is far more voracious and undying and faithful than my love for my son, and I would love him to hell and back. And last, I want you to know that Jesus died and he rose again to break the power of sin and death. And you can be free. One day, this entire universe, not only this entire city, not only this entire nation, not only this entire world, but this entire universe, one day at Jesus' return will be free from sin and from death itself. And you can be a part of that story of healing and salvation, not only in the future, but in the here and now. If you invite Jesus, if you invite the spirit of Jesus to come into your life and reshape you from the inside out. All you have to do is repent. That's a way, a churchy word saying turn away from sin, from your bondage to, you fill in the blank, and turn to Jesus, the Lord who made you from the inside out in repentance and in faith. That's all. You can walk out of this room tonight filled with the spirit of Jesus and on track to healing and to salvation. So, if you're not a follower of Jesus, tonight he is inviting you to become one. But for those of you who are, my prayer for this generation, for my generation, is that we would find freedom in the healing, saving power of Jesus. So maybe you're here tonight, and for whatever reason, because of pain, because of sin, because of abuse, because of your family, because of your worldview, because of your church upbringing, for whatever reason, sex for you, when you think about it, when you do it, is baggage and regret and guilt and shame. It's not fun and it's hurtful or it's painful or it's scary. I want you to hear that sex is tov. And I want Jesus to do a healing work in all of you, particular in the sisters tonight, but in men and women, to do a healing work in how you think about this gift that God has put into your life. Or maybe you're here and it's the exact opposite problem or issue. You think of sex as a God of sorts. It's what you're chasing after, thinking if you can just get close enough, you'll find life. You'll find whatever it is, you fill in the blank, but it's not going to happen. If you make sex a God, not only will it enslave you, but it will also let you down because as incredible as sex is, it can't live up to all the hype. Think about how sex is put on in film, at least, all of the mystery and allure and buzz, spontaneous, wild, orgasmic, thrilling, and sex is all of those things and more, sometimes. If your marriage is healthy, maybe even most of the time. But even then, no matter how good it is, it's not God. The same can be said for love. Is it incredible? Yes. Is it all it's chalked up to be? No. Welcome. Really happy you're here tonight. (laughs) Same can be said of marriage. Is there fulfillment and satisfaction in marriage? Yes. There's a lot of other stuff, too. No matter what it is, food, drink, love, marriage, sex, romance, any of that stuff, anything tove in the world, all the stuff that we make into an idol, we make into a de facto God, it's good. Some of it is very good, but it's not God, and it's never supposed to be. It never was supposed to be. From the beginning... Everything tov, everything good in the created order, everything that you think about and you enjoy, all of it was meant, it was a means to an end. It was meant to push you to something even better, or should I say to someone even better. And we believe that that someone is not a vague, ambiguous idea out in the universe, but he is the person of God in the person of Jesus.